Hi, Sarah Kogan. <laughs> Hi. How's it going, Jennifer? Oh, you know, before we clicked record on this, we were just admiring. Both of us have gallery walls, which you can see on our YouTube if you tune in. Um, and we were talking about the way in which we curate these gallery walls, which is honestly a perfect segue because um, Sarah, well, I mean, you'll introduce yourself in a second as a designer, but like the chaos of not my brain for a gallery wall versus my brain in usual life versus maybe perhaps your way of methoding your gallery wall was something very fascinating to me. Mine was so perfectly curated and crafted of like, where does everything go and what is the distance? Tell me your process of your gallery wall. So actually I started with the big ones first because they take up the most space and then okay. I fill in between. Uh, and it's kind of a very flow I like put on music and then I just kind of go oh what what you know I lay out my images so I can see them and then I kind of go like all right what would look the best right here and then I just kind of start sticking them places and I use command hooks and like the command um, photo strips because then that way if I mess up I can just pop it off and put a new one on and it's not a big deal versus like putting a hole in a wall and I also feel like the thing I like about using that method also is that it allows me to kind of literally eyeball it and be like, do I want this right here? Yeah, I do. And then I just push it on the wall. And yeah, so the trust just- that you have. I mean, that is why you you do what you do and you are who you are, which for <laughs> anybody who's listening, who are you today? I am a costume and production designer and visual producer for film and television. And I champion mm-hmm. independent filmmakers by helping them understand how to craft cinematic cohesion through uh, production, costume, lighting, and scenic design, and how you align all of that um, through, or sorry, hair and makeup, and how you align all of that to your script. So really, it's taking how do we create the worlds that we see on screen, and how do we make sure that we're telling the stories in the way we intend. Uh, I would say, like, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then we're saying a minimum of 24,000 words per second in a script and in a film. So then, how are we making sure that that's saying what we want and backing up and supporting the films that we're telling. And so that's what I do. That's me. Ugh, I love it. But which makes sense going back to this gallery wall, like why you just trust your intuition and why it works the way that it works. Whereas people who don't do what you do on a regular basis maybe have more of a lengthy, in-depth um neuroseed process of like <laughs> making sure their gallery wall is exactly it's not neurotic want. i will tell you that many a times i've had to sit and like lay it out more meticulously i actually i actually love that you're like oh it's this intu- intuition that you just have i actually don't fully believe in that mm-hmm. i believe that skills are learnable and yeah. yes we tend to as people have certain things that we're more capable at doing maybe yeah. than others like i jokingly tell people like I'm not a runner so like if I was going to be attacked I'm not going to try to outrun this person my goal is like take them out sorry that got like really no like, I mean take we them live out for that. Yeah. and then run away because I'm really slow I'm never going to yeah. outrun them so I know that that's not <laughs> worth my energy yeah and yeah, know what you're know what you do and do it well yeah yeah and like or like leverage it it's like know what you can do and what you can't do and then leverage what you can do yeah um to make it work I'm also and underselling so, myself. Like I do, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I know what I'm doing visually. It's just I'm particular. I think that's, that's the right. thing. Well, sure. I just hold on a little tightly because I want it to be exactly visually. Like I'm such a visual person that like if I'm staring at the thing and it's like a little bit off, It'll it drive will. Me nuts. Oh yeah, apps absolutely. Yeah. Um, how did you get into this whole world? Because I I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, whenever I watch anything especially recently and obviously over the pandemic when that was a lot of my time was consumed with, you know, a visual medium of consumption of TV and film. Like, I think my my lens really started shifting to like all of the other elements. And it's just such a, it's a world that I, I, I'm newer to in terms mm-hmm, of mm-hmm, that. And mm-hmm. I just, yeah. How'd you get here? I got here. I actually trained as a performer for from the age of eight until I was 18 and I lost my voice and I was in college going, what am I going to do with my life? Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew I didn't want to go st- study performance anymore. Was that because of the vocal injury or was yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> it was. And also like full blown disclosure of like, I didn't think I'd have the career I wanted because mm-hmm. I 
didn't look like an ingenue. And I mean, it's all those things, right, that we hear people as actors complain about currently of like, I mean, when I was wanting to be an actor 20 years ago, there were no diverse roles for women. You did not see interesting bodies. And I was very much like, I don't know if I want to do this. Like, is this what I want? I spent literally my entire youth performing, thinking it was what I was going to do with my life. So like I did like mixed martial arts and I learned how to vault on a horse. And like, you know, I was like, I'm going to do all my own stunts. Right. So like, I'm a stunt person's favorite designer because I'm like, all right, what do you need to do your job? Yeah, Let's talk about this. Um, You're my people. Um, (laughs) But, uh, and then what happened, I lost my voice and I was feeling very like wayward. And I thought, well, let me just see, like, well, really it was Tony Kushner came and spoke at my first quarter of college. And he's a, you know, one, the Tony for Angels in America. And Mm -hmm. I was like, you're telling me not to study acting as an act, if I want to be an actor. And I'm, you know, go live your life and build life experiences to draw on. And I was like, you've won a Tony and my professor here has not. So I think I'm going to trust you. Wow. And then I spent this year. He doesn't even know this. Tony Kushner never knows this. He's in my origin story. It's pretty great. Um, And so I just was like, yeah, I just kind of was wayward for a year and I was going to quit, quit college because I thought, why? Like, why am I spending the money to be here? I'm dyslexic. So writing papers and reading books Mm -hmm. is like literally my idea of hell. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if I believed in that. um, And so I just was like, this is awful. And my dad goes, well, you always made the costumes for your shows. You painted all the sets. You did all those things. Like somebody's got to do this for everybody else right and you like it so like maybe check that out and thanks dad uh, yeah I'm being perceptive was, yeah and he was i he was the best um i'm definitely a cost i'm a costume designer because of my dad mm. uh, for so many reasons uh and he was an attorney to clarify that for anyone who's curious he had nothing <laughs> to do with this industry yeah. um and he just was like well you love it and so suddenly i reached out to the costume design professor at UC Santa Barbara where I was going and they happened to have it like they had a BFA acting program and so they for undergrads and they just happened to have this amazing design program that was very much like getting a master's degree you know I got I walked out of college with over 10 shows I think under my belt that I had designed like either dance pieces or plays and and musicals and um, I started doing films with the film department um, some of the students there so I got to actually do the thing and I just fell into it and fell in love basically after meeting with Diane Holly and Vicki Scott, who's a lighting design professor, kept me very like in like she just made lighting design fun. And so that's actually where I learned to do costume lighting and scenic design to begin mm-hmm. with. And then that started this very holistic journey as a designer into then grad school, which then turned into me going like I can do anything you want. So you want lighting design? Done. You want costumes? Done. You want sets? I can do that if you really want me to. And suddenly I found myself, you know, um, being asked to do sets. And I was like, okay. Uh, I just kept saying yes. And then I got nominated for best design from the now, I think they're defunct. Um, it was called the Internet. Uh, the International Academy of Web Television nominated me for best design for my work on this series called Inferno. And I was like, well, I guess I'm a triple threat designer now. (laughs) And then that was it. Like, and then here we are. Um, And I've started doing all these workshops on design to help filmmakers understand how it works. Because I, in, in writing some of my own stuff for worlds I want to be involved, like that I want to design, I found that I was meeting filmmakers and they're telling me that they don't know how design works. They don't know how to have the conversations with the designers. They don't know how to articulate what's in their head and how to get it out or how to look at a research image and understand what to say about it and why it matters or even read. I mean, it's been amazing to me to meet people who don't even like, I'll be like, this image doesn't say what you want it to say. And so, and here's why. And then as soon as I, I enlightened them on it, it was like your films about, for example, it was an image of a Catholic priest, mm-hmm. uh, which which felt very Ita- either like Italian or Irish Catholic. They were very clearly white. However, the story was about um, was about 
an Asian um, Catholic community and like Christian community. And so uh, it was like, if that's the world, find those images because this one is is taking you away and out mm -hmm. of this world that you've built around it. And so being able to just help people see that and get clarity on how you see what's in front of you uh, instead of the idea that you have in your mind's eye and then how you can then articulate that too to investors. And that really, I think that, I think that a lot of indie filmmakers go way over budget because they actually haven't sat down to ask themselves what they need design wise mm -hmm. for their film. And it's because it, there are so many variables in the factors in the way that we budget for a project. There's no one thing that you can say, this is definitively what this is going to cost you because it'll be based on what the location is and what, you know, what comes with that. And, um, you know, what's the availability of the location and what's going to happen? How much do you need to actually dress the location? Like all mm -hmm. these factors and how do you figure that out? And I think most film schools go, well, I don't even think most film schools based on my experience and like, this is a very long answer to your question, but um, <laughs> yeah. So basically that's how I started this being like, oh, there's this giant knowledge gap. So like, not only do I under happen to be an outlier who understands all of the design elements of costumes, production, hair and makeup design. But then I also understand directing because I trained with a casting director and we learned as an actor before I knew I wasn't going to be an actor and I, mm -hmm. we had to direct. And so I learned how to direct one of like my fellow actors. So I speak actor language. And then my high school drama class was actually a playwriting class at like a script writing class. So we just wrote scripts every, like that was mm -hmm. our homework was write a script, write a scene, write a scene. And so in hindsight, I was like, oh, I just happened to be some like this is my life's work yeah. and I happen to have such an extensive background in this that I'm able to really talk all these different levels and so that's what's led me to where I'm at today I to love I right love now. hearing people's origin stories just it just gives context you know for where right. people's perspectives are and how they've you know they've cultivated the careers lives whatever that they're in at the moment so thank you for sharing um I have many questions. This is my brain is anybody speaks is always like, I'm the, I'm the question girl that like, you know, in, in high school, people were always like, can you stop asking questions? And then they were like, okay, thank you so much for asking that. Cause I wanted to know, like that was <laughs> unofficially my job, I think. Um, so my first question is this, and we can go in many directions, but my first question is this when let's say we'll, we'll use like a tangible example this whole time and we'll just kind of like run it through i'll make it up as we go yeah um let's say i uh, i've written a, a script for a, a feature and mm -hmm. i a low budget just to keep mm -hmm. it um you know tangible a low budget feature and i am looking where i'm going to be allocating all my funds and i it's a world that i'm creating um, that, uh, definitely requires a certain visual aesthetic. I mean, every world does, but like, it's definitely specific. Is it one of those things that while I'm even from the get, I should, I hate that word, but I should be budgeting for a designer in some capacity or quote unquote, should I be recognizing that if I don't budget for a designer, either way, I'm going to need to be budgeting for a design uh, analysis <laughs> or like yeah. at least like paying for that? Or is somebody able to basically do the design aspect themselves if they have good to intuition or somebody to check with them or if there's somebody who's like on the team who's like really good at researching? I guess it's like the question really is like how necessary is it for a designer specifically to be on staff? And then from there, I have many questions. Okay. So answer that question. I'll start by saying there's a giant myth in the industry that film design is a luxury. The thing is, from a cognitive standpoint, it is it is actually extremely necessary because what design does is it sets the context for your story. Uh, so I'm not asking this because I didn't think it was. I'm you're giving me no, the exact yeah, answer no, no, I wanted. No, no, thank I'm, you. <laughs> Keep yes, going. I'm 100. <laughs> I'm more like I will answer your question based no, 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 on this is exactly what the I want. cognitive science behind yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I I don't believe in me saying yes. Let me tell you objectively what I like. You know, my personal opinion. I mean, yeah. it is personal opinion, but also 
the, from a cognitive standpoint, right? I want, I want people to start thinking about the design in their film as the context through which they see their story. Yep. And so, and the context through which the relationships, we understand story and we understand people based on who they are and how they relate to the world around them. Every story in some way is about that. Every story is about this person and their relationship to themselves, figuring it out, figuring that out, and then how that shows up in their world or how they relate to, I mean, almost always, and then also how they relate to other people and those relationships. Mm -hmm. And so design sets up the, is this kind of raw data as like Lisa Cron talks about in her book, Wired for Story. Um, which is a cognitive science book on storytelling. And she talks about it for prose. I talk about it in terms of how it relates to us as, as filmmakers. All of those design elements are this raw data that help our audience understand who are the players, what do they do, what might they want, why are they here, and what is, and are they working with or against those around them? Yep. And all of these kind of, and also all of those, the prejudgments that we make, Right. When we see somebody and we make it, we snap judgments on who a person is. That's what design does. Mm -hmm. So do you need a designer? Not if you understand how this, how the tools work on your own. I mean, yes, you need a designer because the luxury well, and, and yes, you need a designer. It's not, I don't want to ever say that you don't need designers because you're also paying for the way that they see the world and how they yeah. help you tell the story. So let me be backtrack and say, you need a designer. If you cannot afford a designer, you can hire somebody to consult you on your project. You can um, learn the tools yourself to be able to do the job mm -hmm. because the luxury, the, all of that raw data, all that information that needs to be there still needs to be there whether you can afford somebody or not. The luxury therefore isn't the design itself. The luxury is having somebody else take it over for you. Right. And so you have to know how to do that in some way, whether that's investing yourself to learn the skills. And I don't believe in intuition in the sense, like I, I actually really hate when filmmakers say, well, I just kind of like knew. And I'm like, no, you, you, if you actually trace the thinking, you can trace the thinking behind the choices that you make. Right. You're just choosing not to because yeah. for whatever reason, and the danger is when you don't choose to look at the thinking behind the choices you make, you actually don't know why you're making the choices you're making that then affect the story that you're telling that then affect what shows up on screen. Yeah. So I actually don't believe in intuition. I believe in, in the mastery of thought processes mm. and that when you understand the tools and when things become so up ingrained in you as a knowledge base, they become automatic. And so it feels like you're in this state of flow or intuition. However, you're actually working from a place of mastery. Right. And that is what I actually believe is, is the case. Like, for example, with your wall, if you were to do a hundred walls, gallery walls over time, you would start having a shorthand for your own aesthetic Absolutely. that would then, right. And that's called mastery. And so that's why I go, there's no such thing as intuition. It's just practice and mastery. And when we're clear about the thinking behind it, and it's not sexy. Everybody wants to think that we're like, oh, we're some artist. And it's just like, we have this woo woo thing. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's all the thinking and the training that goes into the way you think about the work you do and then how you go and do it. Yeah. Thank you for indulging my kind of rhetorical lead question. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I think we forget if design is done well, we don't actually pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Or if it's done like in such a way that's like meant to be, I, I just remember watching The Queen's Gambit, for example, and watching the lighting on that and the set design on that and being so specifically oriented to watching that because it was so specific and mm -hmm. it was so clear in a way that it was meant to make a statement. Whereas, mm -hmm. for example, I'm watching The Last of Us and that world is so, I mean, if we really dial it down, that that is so beyond specific and so beyond detailed, but I'm not mm -hmm. paying attention to it in the way I was in The Queen's Gambit because it's just the world is so the world is so the world. Mm -hmm. And so the mastery in both is like one is just very particular in that I should be noticing and the other one is not in that it's so a part of the thing that it just becomes a part of the thing and I take it kind of for granted, frankly, that it's just so curated 
um, uh, cohesively, both of which are beautiful in their own right. And it just goes to show that like, we are watching a visual medium, whether it is on stage, whether it is on screen, Mm -hmm. the whole thing that we are receiving is a visual situation. It's not an audio book where you don't have that luxury and then you have to create it in your beautiful mind's eye, right? And so, yeah, if we don't take that into consideration that like this is a visual world you are creating, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Like that is part, I'd argue 75% of the job is to make it quote unquote, look a certain way. Yeah. Um, And what a missed opportunity to not um, be uh, investing time, energy, resources, whatever it is into that. So with that said, cool. Now that we've established that somebody either needs to have the the research of their own that they are doing in their own mind, you know, their own process, or they've hired a person or they're consulting, whatever. For you, let's say you, let's say I hire you on said feature film. And I know I haven't mm-hmm. given you any specifics about what this world is because I haven't created a craft in my brain about what this uh, film is. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But let's say I were to hire you. What, if you don't mind sharing, is, you know, and you can go broad on this, like what is your process when you yeah. encounter material and how do you go about curating the world's um, and I would I would imagine if you're hired, okay. you know, as a designer, it's if, like a costume designer, it's different than hair and makeup, which is different. And you're working with the other people who are in the different departments. But let's mm-hmm. say we're hiring you for kind of like all of the things. What is your process? Or are there some um, must do's that other people who are not you could potentially start using for themselves? Yeah. Okay. I actually think there's something there else that you said earlier. I'm going to touch right. on this. But before I go into my process as a designer yeah. – I actually want to touch on something you said of like the design um, from the the Last of Us and the Queen's Gambit and the different right. You there's yeah. literally a different intentionality behind those designs, For sure. right? And and then you mentioned how that you know it's this creating like seventy five percent of the process is creating this visual thing, right? Maybe more. I don't even and know I, if percentage I'm making it. No, it's, up, it's but... pretty much that. Um, so I actually the reason I say this is. I think it's important to understand before we can go into how I, my process works. I think it's important to understand the framework through which I look at design and how design functions in film and right. how I often talk about it as film design, uh, because the term design means to create a plan uh, to an act for other people to uh, create and implement is pretty much what the dictionary definition is, right? So designing something means we're putting together a plan that other people are going to do. And as a director, filmmaker, producer that's your job right those are the jobs of those people to and typically depending on and the showrunner right depending on if you're doing television versus a film um and so when you look at the whole way that design works in film it's all the visual choices that you're creating so in film i tell people that there are what i have coined the four storytelling layers in film um so this comes from me in terms of like my opinion um so if you find fault in it, great. Let me know, anyone listening. Uh, let's talk about it. So the first storytelling layer is your your script. And that's the found it, you know, it's the plot, it's the action, like it's what's going on. And that is where we get what I call story type. What type of story? What is the story about? You know, is it a rom-com? Is it a mother-daughter story, right? Like you could look at everything everywhere all at once and go, oh, it's this like multiverse action film. Yes. And, and it's also yeah. a story about a mother and a daughter's relationship yeah. and the mo- and a mother and her husband's relationship and what it means to truly connect to your family. Mm-hmm. And so, and to see people for the, the beauty that they are in front of you rather than, you know, being stuck in your own mind. Uh, like that's one interpretation of that story that has nothing to do with any of the multiverses in it. Right. right. So that first layer is all about the story type. And then what type of story are we telling? Because the type of story we tell can then exist in any world. So, and so the second storytelling layer is the world building. And that is the three-dimensional physical space that we are creating with our cast and our crew to bring this film to life. So what are the sets? What's the physical container that everything takes place in? Um, If we look at costumes, costumes is all about positive space and creating positive volume. And so... Uh, it's all about what, how are we filling the space then with furniture, with the bodies? How do we relate to that? 
Um, and then the way we light it and the atmosphere, how do we see it and experience it? That's this three-dimensional world we're creating. And that's mm -hmm. where what I call it genre, the genre, whether it, because the questions you ask from a design perspective all are based on that. So it's, you know, is it a fantasy, sci-fi, you know, contemporary, period, heightened reality? What kind of world is it that we're living in? Right. So Queen's Gambit, heightened reality of a period yeah. world. Sounds like uh, La The Last of Us. I haven't seen it, but it sounds like based on what you're saying, it's a pretty like grounded in reality world. No, no, no. It's like it's like sci-fi zombies. Oh, amazing. So then it's yeah. a very grounded sci-fi world that feels very real. Right. So yeah. like that's versus something like Shaun of the Dead that's meant to be a farce, for example, where like the zombies look ridiculous and it's part of the mm -hmm. joy of it. Right. So like knowing the intentionality behind the world allows you then to make the question, answer the questions uh, of what that looks like on a physical sense. Then yeah. the next storytelling layer in film is the third storytelling layer, which is the actual filming process where we've gathered all the pieces, we've gathered all the players, and we're now going to actually shoot this. And that is all about taking that three dimensional space that we've created and flattening it into a two dimensional image. Right. We're creating something that lives on a screen. It is yeah. not real space. Uh, and so we're flattening it and it becomes about how do we flatten this image and how are we flattening this world? And so that's what I like to call revelation of form. Uh, and I'm stealing this term from my costume design professor from grad school and repurposing it because it's really about how do we relate and see and experience the body through the camera? What is that relationship that we're creating for our audience? And why does that matter for us as a storytelling tool and in that mm -hmm. way? And then once we've created all this footage and content and art, then we're going to put it together in the assemblage process, which is the editing process. And it's all about how are we creating relationships between the images that we've shot? How are we creating? And, and that's, you know, right, the ordering of imagery can affect the meaning. And For so sure. what are those relationships and how do we relate to it? And so that's, you know, in terms of what you were saying, right, in the 75% of the process is design, it really is. If you go, there's yeah. four layers and the world building, the filming and the editing process are all visual choices. How quickly yeah. you edit, right? The dissolves, like they're all visual choices. So how are we choosing it? Um, and so that's, you know, that's why like, I wanted to touch on that because I think no, that's thank you. so important about what you said um, yeah. earlier. Um, we also forget that like, you know, obviously, we all conceptually know that things take time, <laughs> but really just how many, you know, aspects to the process there really are is mm -hmm. a lovely, helpful reminder. You know, I think often I'll speak on behalf of myself, you know, you want, I want to get to the end result of the thing. And I forget that there are 700 other steps that need to happen in order to get to that thing. And I need to, you know, continue cultivating the craft of process and enjoying my journey. Um, mm -hmm. But in it, in that journey of going from your script to the editing, the amount of um, excavation and decisions and choices and cultivating like you know, all of the like emotional whatever, like all of that is is happening mm -hmm. from start to end. And frankly, we rob ourselves of that gorgeous excavation by wanting to just get the thing yeah. done. Um, and the, the exploration mm -hmm. of what it means to, you know, storytell and to craft and to create art. That is the whole mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, I think hearing you break it up into the four is very tangible because, you know, whether you are somebody who has written the thing and then you hand it off or whether it is your baby and then your baby continues to grow through the four or whatever it is. It's like yeah. there's always something to be learned from all of it, especially when you're surrounding yourself with other creative human beings who know what they know and then you all get to collaborate together. Um, I love a I love a tool. And so the four steps, just even keeping it in one's brain, <laughs> yeah. you know, as one's working, I think is um, really, really helpful just as like a remembering to check in as you go through the process. So thank you for sharing and interrupting me. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, no, I just, I think that it also helps, right? Like you go, okay, did we answer this question at this place? It chunks out the types of questions we're asking. And then, you know, I can kind of go in if you want and start talking about process and how yeah. collaboration process works. Um, yeah. I always go in going, you know, to, regardless of what my position is, whether I'm doing the production design or whether I'm doing the costumes, those are the two on set roles I do, 
I, I know hair and makeup from doing theater because in theater, the costume designers in theater do hair and makeup. And so I'm able to talk that. And um, I tend to collaborate really closely with hair and makeup. Um, you, you have to, you're creating character, right? Really, I have to tell people, please don't call people vanities. Vanities as a word actually means to be frivolous. And mm -hmm. so when you call your vanities department, the depart like hair, makeup, and costumes vanities, you're saying it doesn't matter. You're saying it's frivolous. Mm -hmm. You're saying it's worthless. The definition of that word comes from this idea of being um, a worthless or futile effort. Mm -hmm. And so really what those that team is doing is what's called um, ca it's character design. You have hair, makeup, and wardrobe are doing their character design. Um, yeah. So for me, we're collaborating with them. It's very much how are we building this character and looping in the actor and the director in that conversation and making sure that I'm articulating what I know to them and vice versa. Um, so initially, though, starting out in a process, I always ask the same three questions. And I think every filmmaker wants to ask this, what, these questions, which is, why are we telling the story right now? Why does it matter? Right? Um, who is this, who's this intended for? right? Who's the audience? Why would they be interested in the story? And what is it that you want them to know, feel, or experience walking away from this story? Mm. It's always about what are we trying to say? Yeah. Why are we telling the story? And the reason for that is because, I mean, you hear it all the time in business, you know, and you, and, you know, know your why. People care because, because there is actually, again, cognitive science. Uh, it's really fascinating. There is there is a talk on the cognitive science about like how we literally how we speak mm -hmm. and what they found is that if, and I might have my number slightly off, but it's about 87% of our communicate, if not more, 87% of whether or not somebody will believe what somebody is saying comes from and trusts the speaker comes from how they say it and like how they show up physically in their, like how they say it both physically in their body and through the diction and the way that they say it. And mm -hmm. so people listen to how you say it over what you say and they care because of your why. And so in filmmaking, right, the why becomes your anchor for everything that you're doing and every creative choice that you make. Uh, and I'll tell people it doesn't matter what you like because it's not about you, it's about the story. Right. So the why helps you anchor into that the what you're saying is your script, right? That's that first storytelling layer. And then the how you say it is literally the layers two through four, right? The, the world building, the filming and the editing. And we have all seen like student films where they all have the same script and they all are shot differently and they look and feel differently. So we can all say that the how does affect the way we experience oh, yeah. story. And so it's knowing that why and then that why then becomes that anchor point in your storytelling in your design process of does this choice support the why or does this choice take away from the why mm -hmm. and then it's objective and it's not based on how i feel about it and it takes that out because sometimes the danger we have as creatives is falling in love with that thing that we're just super excited about and then we realize we don't need it in the story and we don't want to cut it because we love it or we yeah. you know or we build but we built this thing and it's so great and you can't get rid of it and it's like well actually the story is taking us another way and this is part of this creative process and i think you know in budgeting for films people have to you have to kind of um, they do this in manufacturing uh and it's funny, it never really occurred to me until this moment, but <laughs> in manufacturing, when you buy a product from, I own it, one of my, one of my four businesses is I have a garment bag company okay. and I've gotten familiar with the manufacturing process and business through that. And so in manufacturing, when you pay per unit, they actually factor in for, um, for mistakes mm -hmm. in the price that you're paying for. So like in budgeting for your film, you also want to make sure you're budgeting for mistakes and not necessarily like mistakes as in like bad things, right? But it could be the, we really thought this story was going to go this way and instead it went that way, which means that this stuff isn't working the way we thought. So we now have to regroup around yeah. it, which isn't a bad thing. It actually means that you're doing the work to figure out what the story needs and that you just, you basically, we want to budget for, for those 
exploration moments, right? So, so thinking about it in that sense, like just like they do in manufacturing, you want to, we want to bring that same kind of mentality to what we're doing to allow our creative team to be able to think that way yeah. um, and, and explore and know that we might have to say goodbye to things. Yeah. So that's where I start. And then it goes okay. into discussions around what are the story arcs? Where do we, what do we feel and experience in the script? Like what, what stands out to you? Like if you and I, Jennifer, were talking about a, a, a film, I'd go to you and say like, okay, so like, what are your big moments here? And mm -hmm. what do you feels like this? And what do you see? Okay. Here's what I see. Okay. And what, and like, and then it becomes basically, it's like creative problem solving. Like my job as a designer is to aesthetically and creatively solve your problem of how do we do show this character arc and how do we mm -hmm. show the way that these people are thinking. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's, that then becomes, it goes into that. And then there's this process of looking at imagery and going, this works, this doesn't work. Tell me what, you know, I ask a lot of questions. Like if a director or a filmmaker brings me imagery, I go, why, why is this here? Like, what mm -hmm. is it about this image that you're resonating with? And I ask them to tell me those things. Maybe this is a weird question. Do you come at it from a perspective of from your own experience and training, obviously, that's like, you know, that there's like certain color palettes that work with other color palettes that you're thinking from texture, you're thinking from like feel and touch and that, or are you coming more at like the marriage of the energy, the feeling that people are hoping to get from the world? Well, I always start with the intentionality. Like, yeah. like, what is it that the aim is as a designer? Like my aesthetic in usually tends to be texture. I'm actually very okay. fascinated by texture. And um, I once was told that I design like, I mean, I do lighting, so it makes sense. But like I design from a light standpoint, like I'm very curious, like to me, texture really sets the mm -hmm. world. And some of that has to do with right how much light does like are they super reflective are they mm -hmm. you know does this a world where things like the light hits them and it's absorbed yeah. like I, those are things that I literally kind of ask myself on a subconscious like split seconds that are almost yeah. not even you know were our eyes drawn to contrast so the higher the contrast in something the more visual conflict right so it's one way of creating conflict visually is to create is to use contrast and you can kind of there's a scale right like you can go straight from black and white which is the most contrast you can possibly get color wise for example yeah. or in texture that contrast would be something that's sought, like highly textured versus something that's extremely smooth and reflective right those are two those are two high contrast elements um and so you can create contrast in those different ways. And so when you want to create something that's visually interesting to look at, it's looking at how do you build in that contrast, even if it's more subtle of choosing a vest that has a little more texture than the pant so that there's a little more visual contrast there and a little more visual interest. Um, and so, you know, and I tend to be someone who prefers texture. So I always go, if it's between these two objects, I'm going to go with the object that has a little more texture because it's a little more interesting. Interesting. Uh, and so like, that's just like on a, an aesthetic choice example of how I would then approach it. Yeah. Cause you I ask that? that just because I know you have, um, these five tenants that you work from yeah. and I know that that was like part of it. And I'm curious to ask a little bit more about that aspect of the things, right? Cause we talked yeah. about, obviously there's like the four, you know, layers to the storytelling building of it. But when you are curating in this capacity, um, are you willing to jump in there for a sec? Yeah, actually, that's a great, great question. So I, and it goes back to that whole thing that I talk about, like, I don't really believe that there's people have an innate ability. I think yep. that it's skills that are honed. And some of that is understanding these five tenants. And when you understand what the five tenants are and how they work on a psychological level, you're actually able to utilize them as storytelling tools. And as you start to learn what the, the psychology is behind them, you'll start to be able to go, oh, that's why I feel this way when I see this type of an it, like type of a thing. And mm -hmm. so, or that's why this image works, right? And so um, the five tenants are color, line and form, 
So shapes and on, right? Shapes um, and line quality, uh, texture, as we talked about, uh, mm-hmm. scale and space. They're reliant on one another. So that's why it's scale and space. And then movement, which is, um, and oftentimes when I say movement, people think I mean ca- just camera movement. But movement also means there's a couple different ways of looking at movement. Movement is literally does something move when the wind hits it or like think about fabrics that are soft and have more movement. You you know, an actor walking with a garment that catches the wind as mm-hmm. they walk feels very different from someone who's wearing something that does not, right? So right. think like a structured, perfect example, women's dresses are the easiest to kind of utilize this example. A soft, flowy dress, right? Even says it, flowy in the name, it has movement uh, versus a structured, tailored dress. So think, you know, a business suit type dress, like a business attire dress. There's no movement, right? You don't wear a business, a business dress suit worlds don't have movement. They're rigid versus artists and creative worlds, right? We, we tend to associate them with loosey goosey and movement, yeah. you know, stereotypes, yeah. but you know, yeah. that's like, that's an example. It could be in a space, the difference between using curtains versus blinds mm-hmm. movement no movement but and are you cur- thinking are you thinking about these five things in relationship to each other or are you thinking about them individually and then in relationship to each other are they never like i mean how are you how are you orienting them with themselves or separately well i actually what i tend to do is um i tell people they're I actually tell people there's a subconscious layer to all of this as well. So like, and then I go, and then we sit and have to just be with the images. So what I'll tell people is actually go out and start doing research. And the point of understanding these, sometimes it's, I want to use this this way. Other times it's like, I want to use this relationship very intentionally between let's say color, or it could be, you know, texture very intentionally. Other times what I also recommend is like, you go out and you do an image pull and you literally pull anything and everything that you go, this is interesting. And this is where the like automatic thinking comes in. So you just start going, something's resonating with me here. I'm going to say, yes, I'm not thinking about it. We're just going to pull this image. And then you go to go back and you start going, okay, what am I seeing here? And what's showing up and understanding these tenants allows you to understand why an image is working for you and why it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm resonating with this image because of the way that the colors are in here and the color palette that's here. So that's why this is interesting to me and why this image works for the story, because it's uh, an analogous color palette, which means everything's on the same side of the color wheel. It feels real. So it makes it really soothing and feels really cohesive that that reads for me for what this world is. And then if I look even further, I go, okay, well, what else is here? All right, I'm interested in the line quality or I'm interested yeah. in the composition or I'm interested in, you know, the the textures that are in this image. And so you start to go, what is it that I'm actually resonating with? Mm-hmm. And now that I understand these psychological aspect of these things, you know, I can utilize that. Um, and then as you start to break down the images and what's inspiring you and you start looking and like, I think research is important because it's part of the discovery process and storytelling. So, you know, you want to be able to discovering is finding something that you didn't know exist, like that you weren't looking for. And that's the best place because then you usually are finding the thing that actually serves the story the best. Yeah. And so it's, you know, I mean, But I can also then go, okay, this is a really rigid character and I want to set a dynamic up. So we're going to put them in like really tailored suiting and also really close up really tight because we want to really push home that they're rigid and that their story then, right, looking at this tenant is becoming softer. So then we're going to start opening up their neckline. We're going to, you know, start choosing something that maybe, you know, maybe they, if it's a woman, maybe they have, um, you know, button, turn down button collars, but by the end, they're maybe not fully open, but they're now wearing like a pussy bow type blouse, yeah. right? That has a little more softness to it, a little more drape, things like that, that are like these subtle shifts in character that we can then create going, yeah. okay, this is where I know we want to start. So then how can I use the five tenants to get me to where we want to go? I or love that so very much because within all five of them, I don't know if this would be like the terminology, but like there's the gradients of, you know, like intensity or subtlety or softness or hardness or, you know, and so I think understanding 
you know, just even taking, you know, shapes, for example, or lines and recognizing that there's hard lines and there's soft lines. What does that actually mean if we look into like the research and like what are shapes? Oh, a square is really harsh. But if we rounded that thing a little bit, you know, just like really going into the details Mm -hmm. um, is, I think I would imagine for so many of us, just a different way of um, paying attention to recognizing that those subtle shifts are actually larger storytelling opportunities. Um, you know, and, you know, I know for myself, I come at it from an actor perspective and, you know, the human storytelling perspective of it, but recognizing that these other elements that are on around surrounding the human, the human being in the story are only contributing to that storytelling. Um, it's just like a fun, I would imagine a fun exercise too, especially for anybody who is newer to this um, exploration if they're doing yeah. it on their own of saying like, cool, let me just for the sake of this as uh, an experiment, try to see what happens if I just take a room that is this type of room and I started in this color palette and I started with these types of lines and this person is wearing this thing and how can I begin to change literally from just the visual perspective from let's say it's hard from the beginning to soft. What am I pulling? What am I not? And really seeing what you can dial up and dial down is maybe like a beginning type of ex- exploration experiment. I don't know. In my brain, I'm like seeing it in my mind's eye of that being like a really cool um, video game, honestly. <laughs> like, I wish there was like a video game that I could be like, cool, if I die. Maybe there is. I don't play video games whatsoever. But like you can go in and like you could like raise contrast and you can do and you can turn this one as a little bit just like kind of like maybe this is like an HGTV video game in my brain. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, they do make like the interior design ones, but I think for filmmakers, what you can use is like Unreal Engine is a great mm-hmm. way to play with this, right? In terms of the previs. I do think that uh, right under part of this too is being able to delegate better. If we understand yeah. the tools and how they work and we know where we want to go and we've asked the questions, right? Then um, in our stories that we're going to be asked, yeah. then we can better delegate our ideas to everybody on our crew to then get the film we want and create a cohesive film. And, you know, one of the things I recommend for every filmmaker is get your designers to sit around a table together. And that means everybody like cinematographer, uh, hair, makeup, costumes, and production design, and talk about the story from a storytelling perspective, rather than a, um, than like the page turners that we see. Like Mm -hmm. we'll talk through it from like a technical standpoint of what's needed, but we're not gonna sit and talk creatively about the story as a collective. And I think that's where we get, you know, disparate, you know, things don't then jive because people aren't telling the same story because filmmakers are then going to the hair department and having one conversation about the story with them and then going to the next department and having one conversation about the story with them. And things get lost in the middle. And there are opportunities that of cross collaboration that could really, you know, support one another if we just start talking about it sooner and make it uh, earlier in the process. Yeah. So as we begin to wind our time, um, is there anything that like you wish you knew when you were first starting out that? Had you known that, it would have saved you many a year. <laughs> or is there something that you f- you want to impart to a listener who is curious about this world and wanting to get into it that you're like, this is the thing that will be super helpful for you to know? Anything in that world that's on your heart? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's funny. Uh, it's like a total like – um. I, it's comes to finances, to be honest. Like that's mm-hmm. been my current place of like, where would I be if I had been a little better about the way I spent my money or mm-hmm. knowing things like as a designer, people tend to expect you to put things on your credit card. And then it's like, oh, I didn't understand in my early 20s that if I didn't, you know, I feel really ridiculous saying this now, but it's like, oh, I put $10,000 for a show on my credit card, but I didn't zero out. So then I got charged interest on that $10,000 and I was thinking, well, I paid the 10,000 off. So it's not that, that I'm getting interest on. It's just my balance and learning in hindsight that it was, no, 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 you're getting charged the entire thing. So you spend, you know, you don't zero out, 
you get charged interest on all the purchases, even if you just put, even if you paid a portion of it off. Mm -hmm. Also being um, aware too of like the stories we tell ourselves and, um, you know, like realizing like recently that, look, you want to, you want to be somewhere, pay to get in the room. If, it, if, if, if access to the people you want to be is buying a $300 or $500 ticket to an event, figure out the money and get in that room because that's literally the difference of you having your dreams and not. And like me not getting that until recently was like, well, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like I realized like that's – if there's a way that you can meet the people you want to meet and you can provide value, which I've learned like I can, so – show up. I mean, and, and that's 95% of this industry is who, you know, and whether yeah. or not you actually make good on the agreements you make. And yeah. so I think those are the things that I'd recommend. It's actually, has nothing to do with the creative side and it's really <laughs> about adulting. I yeah. hate to use that word. I can't believe that just yeah. came out of my mouth, but yeah. <laughs> so. No, it's true. You know, it's, it is a really, it's a, an industry built on relationships and, that means many different things to many different people. But starting to remember that it isn't the icky part of like networking. It's more just like who who do you want to meet and how yeah. can you hopefully get into spaces that they are doing what they do and you do what you do and then mm -hmm. um, building it from there. Um, is there anything else in your heart that we didn't talk about that you want to mention? I guess too. I just, you know, in the other things that I didn't know that I wish people told me is like, be really clear and aware of the thinking that you have that's determining the choices you're making. Because, I mean, I talk about it with the design stuff, but I never really like, it's so much about even in like the creation of your work and moving your career forward, because hopefully, you know, look, by having a better looking film, you have a better odd of getting put into a film festival, right? That's why I care so much about telling this is like, I'm watching people I know create films that they do. I do everything that I was told to do in film school and then it still doesn't work and I don't mm -hmm. understand why. And I'm like, cause the design's off. Mm -hmm. And like, it's the thinking and what are the thinking and the thinking that you're, the thinking behind the choices you're making even with your career in terms of what you think is possible. Mm -hmm. If you believe that $100,000 is impossible to raise, guess what? You're right. Yeah. So where are you making those thoughts? And then how can you shift them? And I think that that's, you know, being clear what you've taken on from other people, because so much of our thinking isn't even our own original thoughts. It's something that we've taken on from somebody else. And so being really clear on that and how that affects how you show up on set, how you show up when you meet people, how you show up um, and feel about yourself, that is so important to be paying attention to because we live in an industry that does love to make you like love to have to reinforce the negative thought processes around us. And so if we can be in control, when we choose into control over that, when we choose into awareness of, you know, all of that, we then are able to trajectory of what we're doing. And so I think that that's the most important thing for people to understand. Like your thinking changes everything and it's, you want to see something different in your career from where you are right now, which is probably one of the reasons you are listening to this podcast because of all the amazing advice and information that Jennifer has cultivated for you. You want to go out there and start paying attention to how you show up and the thinking behind the actions that you're taking so that you actually get the results you want and get really clear that if you don't know, there's a great book by a woman named Crystal Zellner called Life by Intention. So if you really want to get clear on what intention means and how it shows up in your life and the thinking behind it, check out that book. It's available on audio and in hard copy. And with that, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> No, I, I'm, I'm, this is awesome. For anybody who uh, wants to work with you or collaborate with you or hire you or reach out to you or take any of your classes, what are the best ways within your own boundaries for people to uh, find you? You can find me a couple places, actually. Um, so you can find me at sarahcogan.com. Uh, There's all my information, all my design stuff, all my workshops. 
Uh, you can also follow me on Instagram and TikTok at the same handle. It's at Sarah Kogan Designs. And I put up little design videos and uh, just talk all of that good stuff there. And awesome. that's pretty much those are the best places to find me. Awesome. So. I'm so grateful to you for this time um, and for taking us on this journey. Um, it's already a different way of approaching creation or arguably a more holistic way of approaching um, creation that I, I know will be really beneficial for so many of our listeners. And so thank you for um, being so generous. Oh, I almost forgot. You, a, thank, you're so welcome. This is such a pleasure. <laughs> um, I almost forgot. If you guys want to learn more about film design and how it serves your story and how you can utilize it as a tool in your storytelling, go ahead and get my free workbook on um, introduction to film design. You can just go to my site. Or you can find it in our show notes because it will be there. Um, yeah. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us in this conversation. Thank you. This was so much fun. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.